Hello, and welcome to At World's Edge, the fantasy lore podcast. Today, we'll be looking at what the world that was, Malus, was like before the coming of the Old Ones. As many of you are doubtless aware, the Old Ones are pivotal figures in the Warhammer Fantasy Age of Sigmar timeline, with theories about what they were and their relation to chaos enough to fill a video by itself. In the context of the many races of the Old World and the Mortal Realms, they were little less than gods, wielding the power of creation and destruction on a scale hitherto unseen. In this video, we are going to take a look at Malus before the coming of the Old Ones, at the races and fauna that existed in that realm, and how they would have reacted to the rapidly changing circumstances of their lives, as well as what their fate was by the time the narrative of the Warhammer fantasy catches up to them. The world that was, would come to be called Malus, was visited by the silvery ships of the Old Ones. It orbited the Sun Sol, along with ten other planetary bodies and their forty-five or so moons. It was the fourth planet from this star, and was icy and cold at all parts except its terrestrial region, which was tropical and hot. It had oceans <clears throat> and mountains, skies and jungles. The common creatures were large, implying that high levels of oxygen in the environment, and intelligent, implying that although the world was cold, it was not lacking in sustenance. The Old Ones would, before even landing on the surface, use their arcane technologies to move the world from its orbit closer to Sol beginning a terraforming process that would change the fates of all inhabitants for good or ill. They also brought the attentions of chaos to the world through their polar gates, an action which was responded to differently by the unsuspecting inhabitants of Malus, with some seeing these new chaos gods as potential allies, others resisting them, and new races uh, born along with the old ones, and paying them no mind. Uh, finally, it was not just the physical movement of the world which affected the existing life on Malus, but also the active act actions of their servants. The race of Lizardmen was created to carry out the will of the Old Ones, with the Sora specifically existing to cleanse the world of, quote, undesirable elements. We unfortunately do not know what was lost in this time, as there are precious few sources from that period, and less that are willing to chat. Before we delve too deeply, I want to address the Gork, or possibly Mork, in the room. Greenskins are the spore-born creatures inhabiting every crevice of Malice. While it is known that they are not creations of the Old Ones, there is theory that they may have arrived on their ships. It is also possible they were already on the world, but their numbers were kept in check by the hostile environment or fauna. As there's really no way at this junction to know with the scholarly sources available to us, we will not be including them here. Perhaps one day the Slan of the Southlands and Lustria will see fit to enlighten us, but that is a story for another day. <laughs> the most preeminent race of creatures to roam the skies and mountains of the primordial Malus were the dragons, great winged beings of vast intelligence, emotion, and power. These draconic beings did battle with each other, as well as creatures of the world for uh, many of the same reasons that later creatures would, territory and resources. Dragons seem to have existed all across the world, and indeed remnants of them both living and dead have been found in mountain ranges across the entire known surface. In fact, mountains seem to be especially preferred by these creatures. This is logical, as dragons are most vulnerable to attack when they are asleep, so making use of natural environment for protection makes sense. Dragons do not construct. There are no cities, no infrastructure, no evidence of mining or delving, except where they must hollow out a cave to increase their living space. In fact, the only loyalty dragons seem to have a particular locale is the Plain of Bones in what is today the Darklands. Since time immemorial, until mere thousands of years before the end times, dragons came to this parched field to lay down and die amongst the remnants of their ancestors. Dragons are vast serpentine creatures. They are long with tails almost if not exceeding the length of their body and head and a head purchased on, perched on a long neck. They possess six limbs, two hind legs, two forelegs, and two wings. Many of them have horns or spikes made of the same hard chitin as their claws, which protrude from their crowns, spines, and tails. Their skin is covered in thick scales, as strong as steel or even gromerol, which changes hue as they age, while still reflecting their personality to an extent. The eldest dragons are deep colors, black, maroon, azure, amethyst, while newly born, mere centuries old, are lighter. They are nearly immortal in age, being long-lived even to the elves of Old One, with some remembering the coming of the Old Ones themselves. They will grow all their lives, reaching the size of mountains, but as they age, they will sleep more and more. Dragon's immensity is matched only by their lethality, with claws, muscular limbs, razor sharp teeth, and noxious breath all forming part of their arsenal. This breath seems related to their temperament in some ways, with forest dragons belching forth noxious fumes to their red cousins fire or northern relations frost. 
Although deadly and immense, dragons are not mere beasts. They have high levels of intelligence, possessing the ability to commune psychically, as well as reason, emote, and strategize. Although magic is generally thought to have come into the world after the collapse of the Polar Gates, in any real force, dragons seem to be adept at its use. Some of the oldest dragons wield magic on the level of the greatest mortal sorcerers, and others may not cast spells, but incorporate their magical abilities into their breath or scales to better defend themselves. Being creatures of thought and might, dragons were not united in their reaction to the Old One's arrival, with some claiming to have aided in the construction of the Polar Gates, while others rue the day the Silver Ships arrived. Being acclimated to the cold climate of Mollus, they certainly did not appreciate the movement of the world from its former orbit and into one where the world was warmer, though it appears that at least some were able to adapt. It is unknown if the star drakes of the mortal realms are directly related to the dragons of the Old World, but they are certainly great similarities physically and mentally. Perhaps the dragons did not die off, as some suggest, but rather ascended into the heavens to find new lands free of the Old One's malign influence. Seemingly in the same family as dragons who ruled the skies, though perhaps not as majestic, several draconic species were flightless and made their homes amidst the fens, fields, oceans, and even the deep underground warrens of malice. Murworms are vast, slimy creatures inhabiting the oceans of the Old World and beyond. They make their homes in caves, down where it's wetter, and down where it's better, deep under the sea. They seem to naturally live in the coldest waters, the deepest depths, and were more numerous before the moving of the world. They do not seem to possess the same intelligence as their skyward counterparts, but there could just be no evidence of this. Shard dragons are primordial, flightless worms, uncovered by the deepest dwarves and skaven. They have diamond-hard skin and plow their sorry scales and plow their way imperiously through tunnels of their own devising. They are known to have existed since the dawn of records, but as they are difficult to reach, not much is known about them in the ages before the Old One's coming. It is known that the Old Ones did move the continents, forming vast mountain ranges, and would have almost certainly killed many of these subterranean dragons. Whether or not this genocide was intentional or not, like many of the actions of colonists, unknowable. Toad dragons inhabit the fens and bogs which dot the landscape. Possessing no wings, they make up for this loss with their immense size. Toad dragons grow fat on the plentiful food of its environment, using the water table and the soft ground to surprise attack its prey with its retractable tongue, in the same manner as the diminutive animal from which it lends its name. Not related to the dragons themselves, the dragon ogres are so named because they resemble an ogre with a draconic lower half to the race of men who so named them. They, however, call themselves the Shartarks. Shartaks. This race claims to have existed longer than the dragons themselves, and that their progenitor arose a thousand years before the Old Ones. This claim would seem to make them younger than the dragons, but with none to remember that time, who can dispute their claim? The dragon ogres possess some sentient semblance of an organized societal, society with elders called Shagas leading their people in both war and governance. It is said that Shartaks evolved in the swamps of the equatorial regions of the world, but quickly took to living in mountains. They live there to this day, and in ancient times it's recorded that they made packs with chaos from mountain sanctuaries. It's likely that, like the dragons, they found these areas to be secure, as well as cold, reminding of the world that was to them a paradise. Shartak stand many times the height of a man, with a reptilian lower body and humanoid torso portion. They have four lower legs, and two arms, which are articulate enough to both forge and use armor and weapons. They have elongated faces which house tusks. Shartaks are infertile, the last of them being born thousands of years ago, around the time of the Great Cataclysm. They do not any longer eat food, instead being powered by lightning, but this seems to be a result of their curse, and it is likely that they once consumed food, reproduced, lived, and died, as mortal beings do. They will continue to grow throughout their lives, with their elders, the Shagaths, the size of dragons themselves, and their forefathers the size of a mountain. Given that the Shartaks traded their souls for immortality, it's assumed that they're both intelligent and understand the concept of a soul, as well as to forge weapons, and that they were mortal in the first place and feared death, probably at the hands of the Old Ones. It seems clear that this led them to make what was possibly, and certainly the eldest, what was possibly the eldest pact with the Chaos Gods in the Warhammer setting to date. Led by their Shagaths, dragon ogre, the Dragon Ogre race fled into the mountains to escape the destruction of their world at the hands of the Old Ones and their servants. There they found the gods of chaos who offered them immortal life in exchange for undying servitude in war against their mutual enemy. It is unknown how long the Shartaks debated, but when they did, they emerged infertile but powerful. They would serve chaos until the very sundering of the world, regretting their decision as the centuries passed and seeking the release of death. It can be assumed that as they barter their souls, that this release is not a true one. 
as the Shartarks, uh, Shartaks march along the mortal slaves to darkness across the mortal realms themselves in the Age of Sigmar. Dragons were along with uh, giants were along with the dragons, the preeminent denizens of the world prior to the coming of the old ones. And unlike their scaly peers, they had a well-documented society, geographic spread, and economy. Unlike their peers, however, they would be driven to extinction by the uh, creations of the old ones, having the misfortune to run afoul of the ogres. Primordial giants were not unlike the giants of today physically, but were more in every measure. The Sky Titans, as they would come to be known in ages in the future, stood hundreds of feet high with hands and feet the size of cards used by later races. Unlike their, their dim descendants, the early giants were intelligent and innovative, constructing stone fortresses, herding animals, and constructing complex black powder tools and weapons. Sky Titan society lived exclusively in what is now known as the Mountains of Morn, in what became the Vale of Titans. Like the dragons, they chose to make their homes in the peaks of the mountains, above even the clouds. There they carved from the, the stone from the bones of the mountains themselves, constructing vast castles, descending only to, her, to tend to their herds, and presumably to meet others of their kind to reproduce. From a society standpoint, we, we say presumably from about this meeting each other because there's all evidence that the Sky Titans were solitary creatures, living alone in their fortresses, and presumably only meeting their fellow giants out of necessity. It can be assumed that the level of complexity needed to create the famed sky cannons, as well as the fact that giants are not immortal or even especially long-lived, that there was some level of interaction between giants when necessary or desirous. There is no evidence that giants use magic in any case, and in fact are highly resistant to its effects. Even a small giant takes many years of wandering the chaos wastes and eating tainted game to begin to exhibit mutation. A sky titan corrupted by chaos is not something that has likely been seen since, and, uh, and unlikely since that they had an interest in the Old Ones or their ethereal enemies at the time. The Sky Titans would outlast the Great Cataclysm, their mountain fastnesses presumably unassailable by the Dark Gods. They would not be ever able to outlast the Great Migration of the Ogres, where the entirety of the Ogre race migrated from the east of the Mountains of Morn to the west, trampling and consuming the whole of the Sky Titan race in their path. The last Sky Titan was seen a mere 1,700 years before the birth of Sigmar. There were survivors of the race as a whole, represent, represented by the stunted race of giants that roamed the, the wilds of Malice up until its end. There are, they are, however, despite impressions, intelligent, understanding economic principles, alliances, and the use of clothing, weapons, and equipment. Some are willing to hold conversation in Reichspiel, indicating that they are capable of complex language skills and take jobs within the Empire. That said, many seem to prefer the simplicity of the Greenskins, who give them beer and food in exchange for death and destruction. The largest of these remaining giants are the immense bone grinders, solitary creatures who inhabit the safest mountain ranges far from their ancestral homes, and in some cases even lord over the surrounding lands in the manner of their forebears. Another creature which comes to us from this time are the mammoths. These furry behemoths were once the cattle of the, of the Sky Titans, and though those specific creatures were consumed by the insatiable lust of the ogres, they were a far-ranging species and to this day inhabit the cold regions of the far north. Given their furry, fat hinds, it is likely that they thrived in a colder world and fare much less better in the terraformed climate. They are sometimes seen in the south, but only as mounts of chaos raiders. Fimir. While most of the beings populating the world prior to the coming of the Old Ones were gigantic in scale, somewhere more common in size, uh, the, the Fimir being the chiefest example, the full extent of Famir society is unknown, but they seem native to the regions of the Old World. They live and likely lived in the fens and bogs of that land. Today, they primarily inhabit the marshes of the wasteland region of the Empire, stretching from Marienburg in the south to the foothills of the Middle Mountains, and across the sea in the soggy island of Albion. There is no reason to suppose that this was not the case in the past, as this is supported by their biology and society as we understand it. Unlike the solitary giants and combative dragons, the Fimir have a close-knit and supportive society made up of multiple levels of familial clan relations. Fimir clans are a matriarchal megocracy, led by the Mirg, who is the only female of any clan, and thus highly valued and protected by the males. The next layer of rule are the Dirac, commonly called Bale Fiends. They are also magic users. Non-magical nobles form the next rung, and the rat warriors of the Fimir are beneath them. The lowest rung are the Shiro, which form a, a labor class. Fimir are bipedal, lizard-like creatures with four limbs and a bony yet prehensile tail. Their heads are small for their frame and hairless. Their mouths are beak-like with rows of razor-sharp teeth. They stand not much taller than a man and are thinner with the exception of the warrior caste. 
Because of their low number of females, Fimir seem to be slow to reproduce, especially compared to the race of men which they compete with for land. Magic is an essential part of Fimir society, and plays into their survival both on and off the battlefield. All Fimir leadership is magical, with the matriarch and Dirarch accessing the realms of chaos largely to hide their settlements and armies and hide their armies from prying eyes. It is said that the Fimir practiced magic in the earliest days of the Old One's arrival, and is credited with their survival against the genocide of the Saurus. While dragons plied the skies and giants hid in their mountains, the Fimir were in the very swamps now being scoured by the serpents of the Old Ones. It can be surmised that given the preference of giants and dragons for colder climes, the Fimir were dominant, if not the dominant, race of the uh, pre-Old One's malice uh, in the non-cold regions. They construct buildings, tools, and create art, as well as bear a complex written and verbal language. Faced with the destruction at the hands of the Old Ones, Fimir turned to Chaos, the beings who empowered the magic that drove their leaders. In their desperation, they made pacts to serve the Dark Gods in exchange for preservation. In exchange, we can assume they were spared death by the servants of the gods during the Cataclysm, and their grasp of shadow magic was increased to protect and expand their domains. Unfortunately, the power of chaos waned, and even had it not, the gods are capricious and found the young race of men so much more tantalizing. The Fimir limp along in the current setting, a shadow of a shadow of their primordial selves. There is no evidence that they exist in the mortal realms, though if the chaos gods held true to their pact, then they should still be there somewhere, perhaps cowering in their own swampy, cool version of Skaven Blight, Peyton patiently waiting out eternity in the peace that the Old Ones denied them. The equatorial regions of the uh, world before the Old Ones arrived possessed tropical climates that allowed for the evolution of great lizards. While many of the lizard men, Slan, Sora, Skinks, among others, were brought into existence by the Old Ones, or bred for that purpose on the world, they were also taught their servants to tame the similar beasts of the jungles, these beasts, seemingly unknowingly, were the labor, warrior, and transitory supporters of the Old Ones as they remade the world in their image. These are not intelligent creatures in the manner of giants or Fimir, and seem to have been tamed as chattel by the serpents of the Old Ones. Resembling nothing so much as gigantic crocodiles, the dread Saurian creatures stood, uh, stand a good chance of being the argument for having forced dragons to take flight. Powerful beyond mortal reckoning, they are vast and as a toad dragon, but fast as the fastest land-based mount. Their jaws can clamp a mammoth in twain, and their bulk causes the jungle to quake. While not intelligent per se, they do possess incredibly strong instincts, so much so that even a slon can only bind them with the assistance of god-forged ceremonial armor and, uh, and collars. As large as the Dread Saurian, but possessing none of its innate ferocity, the Thunder Lizard is possibly the, great, the uh, largest terrestrial animal we know of existing in the Warhammer world, excepting the most ancient dragons and shartaks. Resembling nothing so much as a mountain of scales and reptilian flesh, thunder lizards are destruction incarnate, but not because they revel in it, rather because they are so large, clumsy, and generally carefree that they flatten jungles in their wake. Though the modern world does not possess the magical ability to restrain such creatures, the old ones could shackle them using their arcane magic, and one can imagine that they serve as the greatest beasts of burden imaginable. Though before that, though, they likely prowl the jungles, eating their fill of plant life, and occasionally stomping a stick on or two. Probably the most well-known of the great lizards that inhabited the young planet, Car these carnivorous creatures, the Carnosaur, were ferocious but hardly unique in a world of titans. Standing bipedally with two small arms and a large tail, their most prominent feature are their overly large heads, which are full to burst with row upon row of teeth. Stegodons are three-horned, tank-like, four-legged vegetarian creatures that inhabited the equatorial tropics. They were easily tamed as beasts of burden and exist in much the same capacity to this day. The coming of the Old Ones was doubtless a period of and, and time of magnificence and wonder, the start of the Warhammer World timeline in any meaningful way, and the genesis of the story of the Warhammer fantasy, Old World, and Age of Sigmar settings. But we cannot forget that, like all colonizers, they destroy as much as, much as they build. The Old Ones brought into the world new races by the dozens, but to do it they obliterated species, civilizations, and knowledge of the denizens that were there before. To the victor go the spoils, and in this world, the Old Ones were the victors for a time. It is therefore imperative that the knowledge of, the, of what does remain of the dwindling remnants of the world that time uh, had before this be not forgotten. With that, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please click like, share, and subscribe, and I look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Thank you.